Heart and Hand is delighted to be partnering up once again with NordVPN, the premier VPN service available. You can safely search out what you like anywhere in the world with NordVPN and make sure that your privacy is protected. Go to nordvpn.com for the full range of offers. everyone and welcome to the third annual autumn new manager hunt pod extravaganza joining me today to discuss uh, rangers <laughs> latest move into the managerial market is first of all uh representing the the younger element of heart and hand ross hutton hello ross hi david yes yeah, good to be back Again, it's ground all day, so I, th- I think you probably just put out the same pod we had this time last year and it would probably do year the business for us, but yeah. aye, good to be here. Yes, uh, all, always fun. And of course, he's big, he's tall, and he's renowned for his sang It's Andy McGowan. How are we, sir? I'm not bad, I'm not bad. I've no idea what that means, but I'm hoping it's good. You don't know what sang means? Not really, I can speak right, French and well, I don't well, know what that means. Well, that, that's... That's something for you to do, Andy. You find that out. Okay. Right. Uh, right, lads, this should be a good show because let's face it, we've a lot of practice um, at this <laughs> over the last couple of years. So uh, I think the listeners should be in for a treat. Uh, they weren't in for a treat on Saturday, of course. Uh, usually we, we go through the game, but it seems a, <laughs> a more than a touch pointless to go through anyway because the events that it kicked off and it already feels like it was something that was less of an event in and itself and really just the trigger for Andy. We said on here, podcast after the Old Firm match, this is inevitable. He will be going. It's now a question of when. And we were right. Of course we were right because, um, look, you know, the people who run the club might know business better than we do, but all of us and everybody listening to this knows Rangers better than anyone else because we are part of it. Yeah, and uh, it's it's a. I was going to use the word tragic situation, but that makes it sound as if it's it's nobody's fault. It's um, it's pretty unforgivable uh, in terms of bill first and foremost. Um, I've said in the last couple of flagship podcasts that um, you know to go from where we were the day before the start of the season to where we are now is. I, I'm actually angry about it. You know, I don't usually get angry. I'm usually quite um, understanding and I can find some rationale somewhere to placate yeah, you, myself. You, you usually demonstrate some excellent sang foie. Is that what that it means? My point. That's what it means, a calmness ah, under pressure when good. everybody else is losing their head. See, it was a compliment. You thought I was Thanks. taking piss. I don't know what I mean. Is that yeah. sang foie? Oh, cold blood. That's what it means, literally, cold blood. See? There's my, my, my A-level French coming back. <laughs> <laughs> it means you're, it, it, yes, it's somebody who demonstrates sci-fi. See, this podcast, folk, not only entertaining, educational. Wow. Now I know what sci-fi and concomitant means. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite angry at, at how we've ended up here so quickly. Um, the board have got questions to answer. Uh, I do, and I know this doesn't need universal land well, I do have a wee bit of sympathy for them because I think the Bill scenario in terms of allowing him to pick his own players was born out of necessity because I think they thought they had more time to pick out a director of football, which is going to be an integral, or sport director, whatever you want to call it. It's, a, it's an absolutely fundamental, integral, key man job. And I think to take time over it isn't it something I would particularly critique. But I think, and I think we all thought as well, that we're going to have longer than to f- October to, <laughs> to explore that avenue. So we are where we are now. Uh, there's more questions than answers, unfortunately, by sacking the manager, which isn't the ideal. And there's a lot of critical, critical decisions aligning in wait for everybody at the club and the players. We'll come on to the players, but I don't think it's... Um, it would be remiss of us to sit here and talk about Bill and isolate the players as if they are no carrying some some big responsibility here. No, hundred percent, and don't worry, we will we will get to them. Um, Ross on Saturday press match took a while before the manager uh, the, the press conference. Sorry, it took a while for the manager to come in after the match longer than usual. 
Uh, and when he came in, um, I, you know, his body language was very down, understandably. I said to him, you know, the fans are now in a position where they're waiting for something bad to happen. Uh, they seem to have lost faith that you're going to turn that around, and surely that si- that that situation is un untenable. Was I think how I put it? Um, and I expected him to bite back at me, and he didn't. And I thought, nah, he's he knows. Ah, he's not a stupid man, Michael Beale. Um And he's probably known this has been in the post since the Celtic game because, you know, we all were there. We all witnessed that reaction, not just at full time, but indeed to Ruth coming off as well. And I think when the crowd and, and the fans lose, lose faith, not just in your team selection, but in your in-game decision-making as well, and they're willing to express it so loudly and so clearly in the middle of a game, it just it tells you all you need to know. And this, this is why I don't really give the board any kind of credit for this decision that they made last night because I think a ruthless board, and I believe I said it after the Celtic game on this podcast, David, that if we were the club that we thought we were, we would make that kind of decision there and then and pull the trigger because we all knew how this was going to go. Instead, what happened is we've muddled through for the past month, but in the complete knowledge this kind of result was in the post and we're now in a position where we're even further behind this Celtic side, probably with an unassailable lead that they now have within the league and we've allowed the position to get worse. So the board only made a decision that they simply had to make after the events at Ibrox on Saturday because there would have been an absolute riot had they not done it. It was completely forced upon them given this time. And I also understand completely the point about wanting to take time over the decision to get a director of football in because it is absolutely integral to how we are as a football club. And I think that's probably been proven over the course of the summer that you can't just give a manager free reign to go and spend what they want. But we're now, what, maybe six, seven months-ish down the line since when we knew Ross Wilson was leaving that role. It's a hell of a long time to sit and try and make your mind up about it and hopefully, if anything, this process can now expedite that. We're going to obviously talk and know about maybe managers that we've heard names of and whatnot, but even more important for me than the manager, David, is getting a good director of football in there because we're joking right now about how this is now the third time we're sitting doing a pod like this. We cannot be sitting doing it again. And I know we've said that the past two times, but this cannot become some kind of annual event where we let a manager go spend millions of pounds of the club's money on pretty much dross, to be honest. You don't want to throw anyone under the bus and then have the same conversation again and fail the same way. That's what madness is. So if we can get a director of football in who has a long-term vision for the club and that's communicated effectively, then that's something I could buy into. But there was no way, absolutely no way after Saturday that Michael Beale could have continued in that job. Andy, when Giovanni Van Bronckhorst was fired, and I thought it was the right thing to do, incidentally, and I, I'm not going to do the revisionist thing that uh, I think a few people have been saying, oh, if we'd mm-hmm. only stuck with him. No, he, he wasn't the right man for the job. Just because the person who came in after him isn't either doesn't mean that it would have been right to, to keep him on. But I did think he got a bit of a bum deal, right? I did feel really sorry for him because injuries, um, certain, you know, players in the squad basically down in tools. I, I did feel for, for Gio and he didn't get to bring in the players that he personally had wanted. Bill, uh, I don't, you know, obviously feel sympathetic for anybody losing their job on a human level, but in terms of did he deserve the sack, could you make a case for him? No, I, I can't because he, he made several mistakes and I'm just going to list the ones that I think were the main ones. Firstly, um, I think you need to forge a connection between you and the support. And Gio didn't manage it because he didn't say enough. Bill didn't manage it because he said too much and yeah. contradicted himself in press conferences. Would say one thing one week and something that seemed totally at odds at that the next, which eroded trust in in him as a manager because people understandably began to think, hold on a minute, you know, they, they said one thing, Today and last week he said something totally the opposite. He doesn't know what he's doing. That is that was within his control. That was a mistake he made. There was the League Cup final team, where he picked the wrong team. There was over reliance on players based on what they'd been like when he was there in twenty eighteen to, to twenty twenty one rather than what they were when he took back over in twenty twenty two. Uh and just on a recent uh, there was the the decision to to set off Celtic at home and play KG, try and play it like we were the away team. And finally, he was given the recruitment keys um, and 
where we sit currently right now, he made the balls of it. Uh, therefore, I think, you know, in any job, we all make mistakes, right? And I'm not an unforgiving person about that because it's it's literally impossible that someone will get every single thing right. It just doesn't happen in any job. If you, uh, <laughs> any of you listening to this are coming home from your work, someone in your office will have made an error. The problem comes when they make a lot of errors and a lot of big errors. Then you've got to say, I'm sorry, you're just not cut out for this. And that's how I feel about Michael Beale. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here, John, doing what you said, but the, I, I, can't, I cannot argue that he hasn't had a fair crack of the whip. And... And you, you know, even if you didn't, even if I thought Gio was right, it was right to let him go. You could argue at least. Yeah, you could say, "Here, hold on." There were, you know, there were mitigating circumstances that I don't believe well, exist for Bill. I know, and I, and, I, and I agree with the revisionism. It was time for for Gio to go. It, it went beyond the pale, but there was some credit there in that. You know what he had achieved with the the European run. You know, a fairer win we made at a, a a different outcome in the league, but um, with Bill. Uh, you can now look at it back with 2020 hindsight, and I try not to do that, but even if you go back to the New Year's Day game last year, the two each for two months up with three minutes to go, and, and they, they get a goal, you know, the first half of that game, we, we, we got it wrong, we set it up in the second half and we, we take the game to them. You just never seem to learn from stuff. In the League Cup final and the semi-final last year were big problems for me because the, the, we have only beaten... I'm not going to say we've only been a better team. We always were. The, the result never lies. But the games are there for the taking, and we couldn't take them. And that was partially doing to Beal, and it was partially doing to some of the players on the park. But he picked them, and I think the set-ups were wrong in, in the cup, both those games. Um, he's had a fair crack of whip. He's in probably two, three, four weeks more than he should have. The, the circumstances that lead to him being given the recruitment keys to the kingdom, as you say, are... Very, very unique in football now. I mean, the Rangers, and to blow that is a big, big problem. I said earlier on about having a wee degree of sympathy for the board because to the degree they've, they've backed their man, you know, if you've got a manager and you are saying you are our manager, you pick him in the first place and you believe in him, then it doesn't take a big extension of that to say, actually, we've not got the right to our football recruitment's a bit up in the air give us your thoughts and we'll back you. So he's had a massive opportunity there. And so far, the proof of the pudding is, <laughs> it's, I mean, we can talk about players later on, but it, it, the, the, there's, there is no shape, design or uh, coherence to the players he's bought and the way we've been playing. And I think it goes back to something you said after the Kamarnock game, I think I did that pod as well, which was that, He's abandoned whatever the idea was that we buy these players, two, three forward players, and play them in a certain fashion. He's, we've not seen it. It's just been abandoned. So um, he's had a good run of games. If we were sitting here three points behind Celtic because they beat us at Park, uh, beat us at Ibrox, then we could probably live with that at this stage, right? But to have the seven games in the league and to be where we are just now is unfathomable, unfathomable to me. And I just do not think that um, anybody, anybody putting an, up an argument for that, I, I, I would love to hear it because I cannot think of anything. I'm the king of backup. Mm. Now, the, the issue is, is there was no signs that it would improve because there hasn't been anything at all in his time there to indicate this is what a Michael Beale team looks like. You know, he spoke a lot about it. He spoke a lot about most things, but it wasn't ever clear when you got onto the actual football field. This is how we play. This is our shape. This is our system. And I'm all for, by the way, a wee bit of flexibility, but not three or four times in a game. And that's what was happening. Um, different players brought in, discarded, used for a few weeks, all of that. Um, and by the end, Ross, it really was just trying to, you know, fling something against the wall. People will, will maybe point to injuries, and that's legit, but injuries do happen. You built the squad. Even when you have injuries, you should still have players ready to come in to slot in. They may be lesser players, and you might not be as good, but it should be the same system. It should be the same style. They should all know what they're going in to do instead of having to randomly change it around, especially when you've been the guy who's put together a fair bit of the squad. Yeah, and I think the one that was... 
or the real clincher for me obviously was the defeat against Celtic but in terms of that kind of thing the real clincher for me was Scott Wright and Matondo playing in switched positions and it just it didn't make sense it wasn't coherent and you're right in what you're saying if Rangers had a defined style of play so to speak under Michael Beale then Scott Wright and Ravi Matondo could come into the side and know their jobs but Scott Wright in that game against Mullow looked lost yeah, he didn't have a clue what he was doing he was playing left yeah, field for Christ's I, sake I've got, I've got a degree of sympathy for him because he came in completely out of the cold you can talk to me about injuries all you like but it's the, it's the boy who hadn't played football in months it's the boy who was on Sky Sports over the summer wishing the rest of the squad well because he was going to Turkey and then all of a sudden he was thrown in out of necessity to try and do a job that he was no, he had no idea what to do So, and I think that kind of just summed it all up for me because you're spot on Michael Beale had time to try and develop a style of play. When he came in, if you remember, way, way back to last November, he was doing his initial press conferences. Obviously, you were there, David. He was talking about taking the handbrake off this ranger side. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Michael. No more horseshoe football. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Michael. And none of that materialised. And it's, it's not the case that he didn't have the opportunity to try and develop that himself. And even last year, I think we had a lot of patience with him, probably more patience than he was due when you look back because of the knowledge that we had this rebuild coming up in the summer. And we were willing to give the benefit of the doubt and say, right, okay, this is a squad of players who are well over the hill and past their peak, players who have maybe mentally checked out, but players who we can get rid of in the summer and allow Michael Beale the opportunity to try and bring in his own squad. And I said on the breaking news pod last night, David, that some people might have heard that managers all over the world would kill for that opportunity to have complete free reign over their own transfers. And I think there was a relative good degree of optimism over the summer. You can maybe question one or two signings. I know some people did in the moment, but you always love those kind of summers when you're bringing in a large tranche of players because it does seem to freshen things up a wee bit. But there was still the concern about existing squad members who we maybe wanted to have seen moved on. And then obviously we have that absolute debacle at Rugby Park and any idea that Michael Beale had about what he wanted to do with this new squad if he was going to implement a new style of play went completely out the window. And I'm sorry, if you're going to be a successful Rangers manager, you cannot be spooked on the first game of the season, no matter how bad or damaging you view that result to be. And then obviously we go into that game against Celtic and two outfield summer signings start in that game, one through injury and necessity. So he obviously lost faith in his own signings. I asked him about that on that day as well. And every little thing like that just built up and obviously broke the camel's back in the end. But patience rapidly, rapidly evaporated over that past month. And it's disappointing because obviously he's spoken before about this being his quote unquote dream job, Michael Beale, but He's made it a nightmare for the rest of us, and you couldn't make a case for him to stay. Yeah, and, and on the players that he's brought in, Andy, um, we'll go back to Saturday. It was an absolutely classic Rangers performance of the last the last year. Good start, miss chances that we should take, and then after about twenty minutes, uh, and our colleague Martin Ramsey says, "But Rangers, you guarantee a slowdown after twenty minutes for." One of two reasons, either we've scored and they relax and think, ah, right, we've scored, this has got to be easy. Or they go in the huff and think, we haven't scored, and we should have done. Um, so that then happens. Then you concede terrible goal from a set piece. Um, and after that, you're chasing the game, but there was zero confidence. And in terms of, was it the right decision? After four matches, four wins, four clean sheets, all it took was one goal. That was all it took. And those players then collapsed in on themselves for half an hour. Rallied a wee bit at 2-0 down to 10 men when the game was done because the pressure is off a little bit, but even then conceded another one. And the players that have been drawing the ire, two of them featured at the weekend, Sam Lammers and Cyril Dessers. Dessers has become, I think, the byword for bad summer transfer business. And in all fairness, he was the manager's number one choice. He was the one that he pursued when he, he, he posted those pictures from Milan that time. It was Dessers he was out to see. He was the guy he wanted to, to lead his front line. And we have to be 100% honest here. He's looked really bad, really bad since he came in. I know the manager said it's that season. Well, he's just getting his fitness back, fair enough. But again, at the weekend, he missed a couple of good chances, his link-up play was non-existent, his movement was non-existent, um, the ball would come to him, bounce off him and he would foul someone and he got uh, a really, uh, when he when he came off, the reception he got was, was oof, I, I wouldn't want to be in the end of it. Uh, and it, 
I don't think it's aimed at him specifically. I think it's aimed at the bad recruitment. Lammers looks, as people have joked, the best player in your fives team, but no use at 11s. You know, clearly got skill and talent, zero pace whatsoever. Don't quite know where he plays, where he fits. Um, two very bad decisions and two decisions that ultimately have been a huge part in costing his job. 100%. We've spoken about it again um, previously about the Essers, and I think I said the last hope I've got for this guy is that he can play in a duo, but I mean, that, that, that is setting very, very quickly. And it is easy to get focused on individuals, but I think we need to because there's, um, there's key positions and there's a lot of things involved in this, more than just the fact that Dessers doesn't hit the ground running and doesn't look as if he ever will. Bill, to go back to his kind of blabbermouth tendencies, was, you know, titillating us with Instagram shots of where he was in Europe and... He said something that excited me, which was I've got a very specific number nine in mind. You remember that? He said something along those lines. Mm. And I'm like, ah, good. Maybe he knows that we need a number nine. We need a, 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 an outstanding striker that's going to score goals at our level. And what he basically did was he replaced Cholak and unbelievably, because <laughs> he didn't rate Cholak really, but at least he could score now again. a good finisher in the six yard box or 18 yard box. He, he replaced him with Essers, who is the most one-dimensional striker that I can remember at Rangers for a long, long time, to the point where you're lamenting that we didn't sign the likes of Kevin Nisbet or Blount Shankland, which is ridiculous, you know, because these are players that shouldn't really be in our wish list. So the, 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 the signing of Dessers mystifies me in terms of what the hell did he see and who else signed off on it? Because if we're saying that we just let the manager go out and sign the player that he wanted, then we're back to Kishinia thing, right? And that's that's bad. The same with Lammers now. For the past couple of games, I've been like, well, oh, he's got something, but he, he's got this uncanny knack of beating his man three times and, and still not getting past them. And mm. I think, because we're going to have to fashion something of these players in the short term, Dave. This is a problem we've got, especially just now with injuries. We can't actually just say, well, don't play them because we've not got any other choices apart from young Lovelace, you know? So with Lammers... Could he do something in the box, you know, because we're not exactly laying on chances for folk. So could he do something in the box in terms of creating it for himself? Probably no, but I'd like to see him further forward because we're getting not very much from him um, where he's playing. In saying all that, David, the first 25 minutes against Aberdeen, they were actually quite good, right? They, they, they were uh, struggling to get the ball and we were creating some chances. We just couldn't take them. Um, I bet so, that. That that's it in a nutshell. You made you said something there. You said it's not that we're making a lot of chances. We are. I think we've become so conditioned as a support that it, because it takes us eight nine chances to score a goal that we assume that we all teams are doing better than us or they must make fifty chances in a game. They don't. They make eight nine. Even really good teams and their strikers take two or three of them. That's the problem. That's the issue. That's what he was supposed to solve in the summer. That's what he singularly failed to solve. That's what's cost him his job. That. You know, the, again, we we do make chances. I, I mentioned there, I think there's usually a slump after 20 minutes. That was a problem. The team don't go and go 2-3 up and then stop. They stop at 1. Um, and that's an issue, and we're going to come with the reasons for that in a minute. But we do make chances. It's just, as I say, if you... If you and a lot of our supporters only watch Rangers. I think they might think that Manchester City make 40 chances in a match. They don't. They You know, if they played well, they make 7 or 8. Um, 7 or 8 chances should see you win the match. Any any game of football at that level uh, and at our level, and it doesn't because the strikers don't score enough goals. So if I if I maybe re- I agree with you there, but if I reframed it and said, well, do we can we make chances when we're low on top, which is probably a, a function of the way we play. We, we we need to be on top before we're actually making decent chances. Uh, either way, David, we said that. You know, a, a goal here or there would made a hell of a difference to this season. A second goal, um, the, the fact was that goal went in on Saturday when they scored that, that set piece, which was dreadful. I don't think there's many phone that I stayed on saying, saying, well, you know, coming to the second half, it's got yeah. two goals. Nah, the belief is, is, was, was just not there. So is, um, this, this, this is the clincher for me in terms of having a fair crack at the whip. You can't pick your own players and then no make it work. And he's not came close to me. You know, the last two games, the first 20 minutes against Aberdeen and Livingston, probably the best we've kind of played in terms of passing football. 
and it's been more born out of necessity than actually designed because injuries and everything else, and I think that says a lot for them. On to the players, Ross. Now, one of the things that gets mentioned seems a perennial fight among the range of support are players. Again, we've, we've spoke about Dessers becoming sort of totemic of the the transfer business. Uh, James Tavernier is totemic, I think, of players who've been at Rangers for a long time. <clears throat> and arguments often rage, and we won't go through them again. We've done them here a hundred times. People will be aware of them. But one thing that gets brought up is culture, culture of the dressing room. And the guys have been there a long time and are the senior people in there, guys like Tavernier, Goldson, Barisic, etc., Jack, uh, Lundstrom, these guys have been here for a while. And I think that for me, it's a case of there's no point getting embroiled in that. Aye, but you know, look, he's played this amount of games for us, and he's done this, and he's done that, and we know when he's at his best. All of those arguments. I think we've got to sit, and the new manager certainly has to sit down and say, right, let me look at this. What's been happening over the last few seasons at this club? And you've got to say, right, first of all, there is a culture of coming second. That's a fact, right? There's a culture of runner up. So are there guys in there that that even subconsciously can live with that. If so, I, I don't need them. Secondly, I think it's time to stop looking at what people have done for us. And Bill was very guilty of this. He came in and he said, you know, oh, they got to a final that they won the league the year before, you know, good players, Kent, etc. And he put faith in them and it didn't work. This season, as I say, he's gone with Tav, Goldson, Barisic, etc. And they're not what they were. You know, that's that's life. That's football. People get older. People get miles on the clock. People, after X amount of games, are going to begin to to suffer and struggle. And that's what's been happening here. The new manager has to come in and say, I'm going to try something different in terms of the much-vaunted leadership groups that club have at Football Club. I'm going to give responsibility to different people. I'm going to play the influence of other people down because whatever you've been doing here for the last couple of years doesn't work. Yeah, what is it Voltaire said, sometimes you need to kill an admiral to encourage the others, and I think that's probably kind of where we're at now. And Yeah, I'm but he said it in French as well. <laughs> well, there's that. Pour, pour, um, encourage, pour encourager les autres, I think, Andy. Is that the pronunciation? Oh, we're learning all sorts tonight. Wow. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> you said you could speak French. Uh, it was about 25 years ago, and it was more or less sexual fears and alcohol-related. <laughs> I'm, not even going to, I'm not even going there. Right? I'm not even going just there. Anyway, we've, we've just killed an admiral. Ross, take it from there. Uh, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> talk to there. Uh, James Tavnier. So, yes, I. Sometimes you need to do that to encourage the others, and I think that's probably where we're at now. And I'm not going to sit and, and contradict myself of, about things that I've said in the past, David. I've been an immense defender about James Tavernier and his role in this side and his importance to this side and really a, an immense defender of Conor Goldson as well. I think you could see last year that we do in the heart of that defence miss Conor Goldson when he's not there. But that's also because we've not upgraded that defence. So if you still have a defence that's coming at a fairly low level of um, output and by output I mean kind of quality in, in defence, then of course you're going to miss probably the best of a what is now increasingly dysfunctional bunch. I get. I don't even really blame the players for that too much. James Tavernier is going to be 32 at the end of this month. Borna Barisic is going to be 31 in November. These are players who just aren't going to be able to do quite fundamentally what they were able to do even in 2020 when we won the league. And you think back then how good James Tavernier and Borna Barisic were down each flank and how important they were. Tav's goals in particular, Borna Barisic's assists. They were absolutely vital and at the absolute peak of their careers three years ago. This is now... Not what, not what, not what they were. You can't keep asking them to go to the well and do the same things over and over and over again and expect the same results. And you're right, this is what Michael Beale was incredibly guilty of. And I don't think he ever quite grasped that just because they were able to do it three, four years ago meant that they would be able to do it now. It's not the case. Players slow down, especially when you think of the amount of games that we play season on season. That is a lot of miles in the legs. It almost matters more than the age factor does. They've played an awful lot of football in that time. So that's one thing. Like I say, I don't even I don't blame the players for not being able to function the same way that they could four years ago. But it's definitely something we need to be able to take into consideration. Whoever the new manager is, when they come in and try and dictate their playing style, the culture thing is probably much more important for me. And I maybe got maybe not got a traditional British attitude in terms of a captaincy 
David, I don't think it's as important as perhaps we make it out. I think it's good to have it as a symbol, but I don't think just wearing an R band makes you a leader. It requires a lot more than that. Now, in the past, James Tavenier has left left in the front, and we've had the benefits of that before. Conor Goldson, we all know what he can bring in terms of organising that defence, but we keep making the same mistakes week in, week out, manager in, manager out. And we're now at a stage where we've been through three or four different managers with this defence. I, I read something the other day that Stephen Davis is now going to be the eighth manager that uh, James Tavern just played under. And none of them have been able to stamp out these stupid individual errors. So at some point, it does become more than just a managerial problem and more about a personnel problem. If you have a culture of not even just accepting those kind of mistakes, but just becoming almost immune to them at the fact that it's just something that happens and it's like the weather, you can complain about it raining, but you're not going to be able to do anything about it, then that is a massive problem. And I think it would be a huge statement of intent from a new manager to come in and drop one of these senior players. And I'm not saying this to throw anyone under the bus. I don't really want to do that on here. But we need to see something different. There needs to be some kind of clean break. And that was always a concern when Beal came back to the club, is that there was not going to be that completely new, fresh start that you would get with somebody else. We kind of hoped for it under Gio, but I understand he was inheriting what he got. Michael Beal, that was always a concern. We need to see something new, because if we go with the same tried and failed methods, we're going to get the same tried and failed results. And the support just can't palette that for any kind of greater length of time than we already have David whoever comes in he needs to inspire the support just to get back to Ibrooks because the last couple of games fans have been voting with their feet whether that be before the game not buying tickets or whether that be during the game leaving early eh, especially when we go a goal down so they need to inspire us back into the stadium and send a signal very early doors that something is changing at Rangers and symbolically dropping some of these senior players and maybe bringing through some youth players would be a hell of a way to start doing that yeah, I mean, I think you do that. I think that you you look at it and you say, do you know what, I'm going to play, for example, Bailey Rice. Now, he'll make mistakes, but fans are much more forgiven of that because there's a potential longer-term upside. We get that. Um, Adam Devine, etc. So uh, I do think that there's, there's leeway to do that for a new manager if he's clearing up front at the start about it and says, look, by the way, they'll make mistakes. Okay? Um, don't slaughter them when they do. But long term there's there's an upside here um andy we now have a, a management an interim management team led by stephen davis um assisted by alex ray stephen smith and uh, a couple of others uh, helping out as well a short-term solution obviously somebody had to to go in and make the decisions and, and make the changes i don't anticipate it being a long-term thing it, it shouldn't be incidentally mm. and it should be they should have a clear idea of a time frame in, in place that they want to have a new manager in place. Um, but your thoughts on that particular lineup? Uh, I, th- I think from uh, the board point of view, they've got to get somebody in that the fans immediately give the benefit of the doubt to. So, in Stephen Davis, that's certainly the case. Um, I think Alex Ray, <laughs> I quite like Alex Ray, right? I know he's. He had a, a bad time at St Mirren, but um, I like listening to him on TV and radio. And contrary to popular belief, he did quite a good job with Paul Ince, keeping them up at least the first season uh, at Reading under extreme, really, really extreme circumstances. Um, so he comes in and gives a wee bit of uh, experience, uh, an older head. And I hope he can bring what he brought when he came as a player, because I wish we'd signed him three, four years before we did when he was a player, because he was very, he was very, very underrated. Um, and his one year at Rangers, he was fantastic for us, I thought. Two years. Two years. Um, so it, it is what it is. Um, the expectation levels will be dampened by the fact that, you know, it's interim, therefore we're not expecting miracles. So, because I'm quite worried about St Mirren, I mean, to be quite honest with you, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but... No, it doesn't. You should that, be, because at the moment, playing he's playing better. Aye. They're playing really, really well. Stephen Robinson's got them really other, functioning. Other than the fact we're Rangers, we wouldn't be favourites. If you were Aye. just looking at the performances of the side, it's the fact that, you know, we're Rangers there, St Mirren. Plus, I can't remember, I've ever seen a good game between Rangers and St Mirren at Paisley. We always play... You know, Thankfully, usually get a result, but my goodness. So it will be a tough game. I do. I agree with you. The fans are not going to chuck Stephen Davis under the bus no. um, because we do understand exactly what the job is and what he is being asked to do. Somebody has to do it. 
Uh, I'll tell you this, Ross, right now, though, I love Stephen Davis. If if that if the players in the dressing room make him look silly, then I, you're going to have to hold me back. I'll be I'll be going there with my walking stick. <laughs> yeah, there's a much more emotional connection there with Stephen Davis as well. But Andy, I know you said you're worried about Paisley. I don't, I don't even know if I've got the energy to be worried about Paisley anymore. I, I do, and I don't want to sound defeated. I do think the league's probably a bridge beyond us at this point. But if we can muddle through until the, the mercy of the international break, then Stephen Davis will have done a great job there. And it's fair play to him for stepping up into this absolute bin fire to take it on. He, he's an absolute Rangers man through and through. And we all know what Rangers means to Stephen Davis. So to try and step up and help us out, this probably goes out to all of them actually in this situation. It's, it's much appreciated. And this is the opportunity that they now have is that they can get us through into this international break and we have that time to get a new manager in and loads of names have been thrown about people who are in working out of work but it is an opportunity to be able to kind of take that step back there's no immediate need after this next kind of couple of games to be able to have somebody in who can come in and hit the ground running but if you can get somebody in early in this international break so that when the players return those who are away the training is there the coaches are there and we can just try and move on from that point and that would be fantastic because what we cannot afford David, is for Stephen Davis to be the interim manager on the flip side of this international break. Yeah. Something has to be done before Hibs at home in a couple of weeks' time because there is no excuse for it now. We have all known this was in the post and Michael Beale sacking was coming. Even if they didn't want to sack him after the Celtic game, they'll have known that it was just around the corner. And if they weren't looking at new candidates for the job before then, that should have bloody put a rock up their arse so that they were. There is no excuse not to have somebody coming in for us getting back from this international break in football because we cannot afford, even though the league might be away and over the hill at this point, to keep muddling on. And it's not fair on Stephen Davis, it's not fair on the coaching staff, not fair on the players, even though my sympathy for them is quite limited. And most importantly, it's not fair on the fans who have forked out for season ticket money and all the rest of it. So they need to use this as an opportunity just to get through these next couple of games and get somebody in by the time we're back, perhaps. Andy, you've been accused in the past, let's face it accurately, of being a, a bit of a bold for later. Um, <laughs> I don't so, know what that means. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not even going there either. Um, but <laughs> learn a lot about you. Then. I tell you what, never judge a fucking book by its cover, folks. That's all I'm saying. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that has been put is some bad, manage- uh, bad decisions in the managerial chair. No football people. Graham Soonis has made... The comments, uh, Simon, he made these comments and Simon Jordan was talking about them today, um, that he doesn't think that there's anyone there who has football knowledge, which I think is a legit a legit shout. Uh, so therefore, it's the, you know, do you trust them to, to pick the right candidate, to pick the right person for the job? Um, and against that, is it something the board should be looking to rectify to bring in somebody who has that football knowledge and listen to them a little bit because here's the thing, right? I don't think this board are bad guys, and I know that that might annoy some of the listeners, but they're not, right? And in terms of stabilising, there's all this stuff Andy's talked about over the years have done a good job. They've put their own money in, and they've taken the club from a far worse place to a far better one. But when you are making incompetent decisions and your heart's in the right place, then they tend to still have the same effect as incompetent decisions taken by somebody who doesn't care. And that is an issue. You can't just keep saying, "Ah, oh, well, they're good Rangers men, and that uh, you know they're doing their best." In much the same way as for a manager, there comes a point where you say, "Hold on, here, you made too many mistakes." The same thing applies surely at boardroom level. And you know, Bisgrove is is new into the job. It was Robertson who was there the last time making the decisions, so it is slightly different, but. Is there a legitimate shout to say you need someone in there who knows football better than you do? You know business, you know running a football club, but you don't know dressing rooms, etc. Um, I'll probably go a wee bit against the grain here. I think that people in that position, and I'm saying people in that position, I'm talking about chief executive, uh, chairman, right? So Ben and Bisgrove in this case. I think... Um, I think they have the right to make it their decision because ultimately they carry the can for it, but they, they would be daft not to be taking a lot of advice from many quarters. I hear, I've heard a lot and I hear a lot about football people in inverted commas um, should be making the decisions. And you know who, who can argue with that? You can't really argue with it because it's just such an obvious thing to say. But 
my mind goes back to Walter Smith now. We'll not hear a word against Walter Smith, but Walter Smith's recommendation for the injured manager of Derek McInnes, his strong recommendation, and I wouldn't have bought that myself. So we've got to be careful that, you know, a lot of football people have made a lot of crap decisions as well. Michael Beale was a football person, if you might put it that way, and look at the decisions he made. So I think um, the board have got to live and die by their decisions. So if that's the case, then they've got to allow them to make their decisions. If, if you let me indulge me in a bit of existentialism just for a second as well. The thing with the board is that, and I see the board, the investors, we've got um, two things that have to exist and they're not mutually exclusive. So I, I, I try to express this and I, and I don't really do it very well on Twitter because it's a hard thing to express. Our, our situation as a club just now is that we're in a really, really good position in terms of investor spread. We don't have a majority of shareholder we are very, very well, as, as we have ever been, insulated from uh, takeovers and things like, you know, 777 buying Everton or speculative Americans that we know nothing about coming in and, and owning the club. I, that gives me a huge degree of comfort, and I think we need to protect that by all means possible. What I don't like to see is that getting eroded by the kind of conflation of football decisions. Um, so this is why I am really, really praying that the board can make decisions that work. I think there's got to be a realism in there amongst the support and the board, this kind of, a, a kind of mutual understanding. Mistakes will be made. And I think what we've also got to understand is when we do, or if we do get another sporting director, it's not to be treated like a football manager. I think sporting directors and things that they are handed as a remit take time and you've got to let it breathe and you might actually have a year or two where it actually doesn't look as if it's progressing but you've got to give a plan of three four five years at least so um if we went to a kind of model davy where i'm not saying i want this to be watford where we're hiring fire at will but i think personally speaking i would be a wee bit more liberal about changing managers than we have been traditionally because i would like to see as ross alluded to earlier on clarity of vision, an actual statement of mission, if you want to call it a mission statement, of what we do as a football club. The the, the, the sporting director underpins that, but is not absolutely exclusive to that. You know, if he leaves, if he leaves, then somebody else can come in and pick up that same mission statement. But the football manager has a job to do, which is very, very clear. And if they don't do it, then we, we don't have any qualms about moving them on finance dictating whether it can do that or not. So I'm rambling on a wee bit here, but what, what I'm trying to say is that Sunis, the likes of Sunis has got a lot of respect. I'm sitting in my office and I'm looking at a brilliant picture I'm sitting and it's signed and it's for 1986. I love the guys are God to me. He's just the right side of relevance nowadays and I don't think he is the person that we should be going to, to ask for on the button uh, information about what, what happens next to our club. I think we need to take a widespread of advice and, and um, Take it for there. Personally, I think Bennett and Bisgrove are going to make the decision themselves because they'll be held responsible. So it's not actually fair for somebody else to be making decisions on their behalf when they carry the can. That may be that may not be a popular opinion, but that's what I think because that's what I would want to do if I was in their shoes. Um, existentialism and a Malcolm X quote as well. I mean, this is really a Malcolm X quote by any so, means necessary. Did I say that? In the Nation of Islam. Right. Well, no, that, yeah, con- that that'll be controversial, you know. See, see, <laughs> see if civil war starts in the streets, Andy. Then I, I know, I know where I'll be. Actually, I, I know where I'll be hiding. Um, is probably more accurate. But uh, Andy no, X, like Andy X. <laughs> the <laughs> mystery man. Yeah, you'd look good in a berry, I think. <laughs> Aren't you sit that? Uh, no, Aye, why not? Why not? Right, uh, Ross. On to managers. And I spoke about this when we were talking about needing a new manager theoretically last week, because again we knew it was coming. And I said uh, it worries me slightly the discrepancy between what some supporters, not all, but some supporters think we can get and what realistically we can get as a manager. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, for instance, today, uh, I, I, someone said to me, what about Marcello Gallardo? He was on two and a half million in his previous job and he's apparently looking for five in his next one. It's not going to happen. Um, I think sometimes as supporters, we can have this romantic idea that people want to come for the challenge. And because it's our club, we go, oh, you know, people should want to come here. And I'm not sure it actually works like that in the real world. People want to go to England, Italy, Spain. That's where top managers want to go. 
So names are going to be put forward that, in all honesty, aren't hugely appealing and don't get you off the edge of your seat. Then it'll be a question of whether the man rather than the name can energise the support. But while I'd like us to be ambitious, there is a ceiling, unfortunately, and that ceiling is finance and the fact that not a lot of top managers want to come to a league where, with all due respect, you're going to play Motherwell and St Johnson four times a year. And that's why managers get itchy feet and leave this league the kind of first time well, opportunity. That's yeah, why. Andy Andy mentioned something there. He said, well, I think we're going to have to get used to more managers because we're very proud of the stats in our history and that's un- that very much so and, and we're, we're right to be on. so. But what's going to happen now in Scotland is that if someone does well, even for us, they're going to leave after a couple of years. Gerard is the example of that. If someone does badly, we're going to sack them. You're going to have a higher turnover of managers. It's just a fact. Yeah, that, that's just modern football. And I think as fans, we kind of, in terms of managerial search, we vacillate between, oh, nobody's going to touch this bin fire or a barge pole. Why would you want to stake your reputation against that? To the complete opposite extreme, which is, well, we're Rangers. Why wouldn't you want to come to us? Um, and that's why you see names like Graham Potter, for example, being linked. Graham Potter, who, uh, if you believe it, today has already ruled himself out of this job. But I don't think he was ever really in the ruling just because of those financial considerations that you mentioned there, David. So we do have those sort of two polarising opinions on whether you'd want to come to Rangers or not. But I'll go back to what I said earlier on. No matter who this new manager is, whether he's a, a fresh-faced guy from Europe, whether he's an old head, whether he's going to play youth, whether he's going to bring in senior players, I don't care. I can hear an argument on anything. Whether he's a Rangers man or not, this is another thing that we get to hear all the time. Where he has to kind of know the club. Well, he doesn't, right? All he has to do is come in and do a good job. I don't really buy this idea that we will automatically be made better by having more Rangers men in the dugout. And I think people have possibly fallen into the trap of thinking that's going to be a bit of a silver bullet. That's just my opinion. But no matter who it is, they need to inspire the support again because we're completely apathetic to where we are at the minute. Even if you look at, and it's never a good barometer, of course, but if you look at the kind of bookies odds on who they might be thinking are in the running for the Rangers manager, you look at the replies to that, and you look have the conversations with your pals or your family, whatever. Nobody's inspired by this. And over the last twelve months, I think our morale has been battered from pillar to post. Obviously, with the kind of penultimate end, the uh, combination of Geo's reign, and then the absolute debacle of Michael Beale. So we need to be enthused about going to Ibrox. How often have we said lately that going to the football is a chore? And it's not something that we actually look forward to doing. As, as fans, we don't deserve that. We deserve a lot more. So whoever it is, they need to have the presence of personality to be able to inspire us again. And that comes from being, first and foremost, a good football manager and getting us winning on the park, but also building that connection with support from the off. And there's a, there is a happy medium between Geo not saying anything, really, in a press conference or engaging with the support and Michael Buke saying far too much. There's a happy medium there. So somebody who's circumspect in what they say in a press conference, but personable and engaging in that sense and can act as a figurehead for Rangers, because I do think we desperately need that as well. Somebody who can absorb the pressure that comes with um, being the Rangers manager and existing within Glasgow, that's a tough gig even in itself. Good managers, brilliant managers that have been not just at Rangers, but Celtic in the past have completely melted under that kind of pressure of being in this goldfish bowl. So it requires a very kind of unique skill set so no matter who we go to, no matter who we bring in, like I say, I've listed off all those kind of characteristics and personal traits, they just need to be able, very first and foremost, to be able to inspire us. Again, do that by good football, but mainly do that by winning. And obviously that's easier said, <laughs> said than done. It sounds like the Dan, the pub, the only tactic is to win. But if you can go back to an attractive brand of football, take the handbrake off eventually, um, and it gets back to a kind of winning style, then that will inspire us back again, no matter who it is, they need to be able to do that first and foremost, because we can't be sitting in a year having this exact same conversation again. No, exactly. Um, and a few people have asked me who would I like, and I, I genuinely don't know. And to be honest, I, I'm just going to wait and see who gets it, because I'm not picking the new manager. And uh, I'm, But what I would say is, if you ask me what I would like, Two things. One, Andy, I'm a great believer that the Rangers manager, you need a char- you need character, not mm-hmm. a character. A character sounds like one of those annoying cunts in, in, in your work <laughs> that wears a novelty Christmas tie and stuff. Um, you need character. Uh, you need to be the type of person who is strong, who accepts that he's the figurehead for a huge and special institution, which in this country is you know almost like a religion. 
you need to be able to cope with the pressure that that will bring, the emotions that that will bring. You need to be able to protect your staff from it. You need to be able to command respect from both the players and the supporters. Um, and I think that if you look at in my lifetime and even before that, successful Rangers managers are the ones who have that, who had that presence. And presence is a different thing. Um, different people have it in different ways, but we know what it is and we certainly know when someone doesn't have it. And then I'd like, and this is maybe you know, overly simplistic, but it's true. I'd like us to play football that doesn't make me want to scratch my eyes out watching it on a Saturday or a Sunday or whenever we play. Uh, those are my my two things. It's a lot, but if you have the ability to do both, to be that leader and to bring success, you basically become a god. Well, a lot of the characteristics you're talking about there, I mean, it, it does sound obvious, but the Rangers job is the hardest and the easiest job in the world because, as Bill's just found out, it can be the hardest, but you've only got one team to beat. And if, if you do that, then you, you, it's not like you're going down to the championship and having to claw your way out of 10 teams that are overspending to get to the Premiership, which is a hard gig. So I think... I'm kind of dispensing with my snobbishness of who we should or shouldn't have as a manager. I'm very, very open-minded, actually. And the, the characteristics you're talking about there, I would echo, because the, the, the thing about character, there's a hearts and minds aspect to it. This is what got Gerard through, and it was because of who he was, really, first and foremost. But it was more than that. It was also things happening on the part that gave us belief that we were going in the right direction. And I think as long as you've got that, you've got a chance. So I'm I'm really really open minded. Uh, my mind drifts back to McLeish. McLeish was a very left field appointment. If you remember, we went for advocate and the spending that he had to probably the best youngish manager in Scotland. And I think you'd agree with me. There was a lot of eyebrows raised at that time that McLeish was was kind of handpicked for that role. But he came in and did a lot of things we we're talking about there. The football was good. A hearts and mind aspect was there. He spoke about um, what Rangers needed to be. He knew what it meant, and he had the the mental fortitude to actually withstand the expectation at that point in time. And he went out and won the first two cups that he could, and you know the, the next season was sensational. Well, I'm looking for something that's similar to that, and this is why. Um, I mean, when I hear Potter, I don't I, Disney turn me on at all because first of all, it's ridiculous. Potter could probably buy Rangers before we could get him right. But I'm, I'm looking for somebody that's got the right stuff, in inverted commas, and a bit of true grit. It's more than just about tactics and hearing the, the, the football philosophy. It's about handling players and making them run through walls. Now, that might mean that we need to change a bit of personnel here and there. I think we do need a wee bit more of a Scottish backbone, I'm going to be honest. But whoever we get, I'm looking for the belief to flood through the team straight away. Seven points. It's hellish. It's not insurmountable. It's very, very tall order. But I want to see the next manager coming in saying, well, we're, we're going to give it our, our damnedest to do that because that's where it starts, is actually not giving up because of what the cards you've been handed. So it's a big, big decision. I do not envy it. I think I said this the last time when, when we lost um, Gerard. I do not envy the people that are going to make this decision. The walls close in fast if it's wrong again. But I think as a support, we've had a lot of patience for the last 10 years. Uh, I just sense that I've never felt my fellow Rangers fans have been as cynical and jaded as they have been for a long, long time. I don't tend to get there. I'm, I'm a, half, a glass half full guy. But even I've been tested Sanquan. here. Sanquan, yeah. So uh, I've been tested here. But the next guy that comes in, we've got to give him a chance. Um, the players have got to respond. See if they don't, I'm talking about any of them. I'm talking about even my fan favourites, Carmel, whoever. If they don't respond, they go. And we need to be we need to start having a wee bit of ruthlessness across the club that the standards are going to come back and there's only one thing that matters and that's winning. We've got to get back to that. Yep, that's that's it in a nutshell. I mean, in terms of not envying who who makes the decision. I go back to, to something an old boss of mine said to me one time, Andy, when I was complaining about something in, in work and said it wasn't fair. And he said, no, nope, life isn't fair. And also uh, it's your job and you wanted it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was it in a nutshell. So, yeah, um, it's John Bennett and James Biscoe's job and they wanted it. So this is it. And yeah, bring us, bring us somebody that, 
can enthuse us, can bring us success and can make us, as as we've mentioned here, proud of the club again on the field. And uh, as I say, you manage that, then you become immortal. That's that's the, the ticket. But my God, the reward is huge. Right. Thank you very much to everyone for listening. Thank you to, first of all, Ross. Thanks, David. See you again next year. Yep, back here next year. You're booked. Andy, you too, mate. Don't go too far. I won't go too far. Fantastic French lesson. It's, it's all coming back to me. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Don and his Berry and getting his M16. Um, plenty of, of other stuff and, and loads of coverage on this, as you can imagine, over on Heart and Hand and Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. Thanks to our executive producer in London, Mike Lee, Paul Miles. Thanks to our sponsors, NordVPN. And we'll be back here next week. Until then, take care, everybody. Bye bye. We'll